Happy New Year's, everybody. Welcome to the first PAC Super Regional Service with Orange County. You know, it's so great to be here. You know, I believe this is the most people we've ever had in this auditorium. Look around at all your brothers and sisters. We're not going to be here for very long. You know, it's so exciting to uh, be together. I appreciate everything that's happened uh, so far. The service has been incredible, amen? And I really, really do want to welcome Colton and Mandy and, and all of the brothers and sisters from Orange County. Welcome to your new family, the PAC Super Region. Great to have you guys. You know, uh, also today we've got another very, very special family uh, that's uh, here with us. One of my dearest friends, uh, he and his wife, uh, you know, I came over to uh, the City of Angels Church uh, limping and dragging. Anybody ever limp and drag their way on into the church? And, uh, you know, I had never met the Kernans, and so I was so excited to get to know them. And, and uh, it's been incredible uh, getting to know Tim and Leanne and their amazing family, uh, Junior and David. I want to thank you guys for wrapping your arms around me and Emma. Loving us, taking care of us, all the talks that we had. I can honestly tell you today, I wouldn't have made it without the love, support, strengthening, and friendship of Tim and Leanne. And Emma and I are super, super thankful for both of you in every way. You know, also today, uh, there's a very, very special sister. Uh, she turned 29 today. Uh, she's an amazing sister who actually married a younger man. But today is Natalie Fedelinka's birthday. Happy birthday to you. Happy birthday to you. Happy birthday, dear Natalie. Happy birthday to you. Uh oh. <laughs> We love Natalie so much. I don't know what that last version is, but I like it. I like that. You know, y'all were leaning out like this, doing this right here. What, what's, all, what's all that about right there? What is that, the slide? <laughs> but you know, we're, we're family, right, church? And we believe in celebrating uh, each other. Now, so far, you guys have really been on your best behavior. You're so polite and pristine and proper. Y'all need to loosen on up. I mean, let's get wild in the kingdom of God today. You guys, you guys are just a little bit too formal for me. I, I'm used to Metro being a lot loose. Uh, maybe it's the, the Orange County pristine and properness that's come on in the building. I mean, I mean, I, I, I know Colton and Mandy are, are nice and, I mean, pristine, but we need to loosen it up a little bit today. I'm so excited. I, you know, we've had a great service. I appreciate it. Uh, all the international prayers. Thank you, brothers and sisters, because we're a movement around the world. You know, and, and I, I just appreciate it uh, just so much, Ron, coming up here doing the announcement. So many incredible and wonderful things going on in the City of Angels Church. Amen. Amen. And then I appreciate it uh, so much, uh, the, the, uh, the communion and uh, just Emma being here. You know, truly, when we take the communion, we occupy the most holy and sanctified part of our service. And I hope we all took it and we're all cleansed from sin right now. So that means we can really let go 
with God. I appreciate Emma so much. Uh, she's been my life partner for so long, my wife, my rock, you know, my, my, my heartbeat in every way. And I thank God for Emma so, so very, very much. You know, I appreciate so uh, 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 much the Aaron doing the contribution as well, you know, and he holding up that poster. You know, growing up, uh, you know, you didn't, you didn't get to just kind of give. You know, we, the posters we saw was Uncle Sam pointing at you going, I want you. I mean, where are my old heads at? Y'all remember that poster? I mean, that was the scariest poster in the world. I used to see it in my history book, and he would have that mean scowl on his face, and he'd be like, I want you. Well, God's doing that to us now, right? I want you. God wants us as well. You know, we're going to be talking about grace, and I'm really just going to be sharing my quiet time with you this morning. Y'all know what quiet time's all right? You know what? Y'all are just too stiff for me, man. Y'all need to know. I'm just going to talk about grace today. You know, I hope y'all had an incredible Christmas holiday, a time to study and pray and get close to God. I, I know it was incredible for me. I just studied out Paul and, and, and what grace uh, meant to his life. And I know for me, I'm, I'm up here because of grace. I was baptized at 19 years old. You might not know it, but I've been a Christian longer than I was a non-Christian. How many of you have been a Christian longer than you've been a non-Christian? I look forward to the rest of you guys catching up with us. But you know, over the last 30 plus years, there's been so many tears. I've cried myself to sleep so many nights. It's been such a battle walking with God fighting for my faith, staying faithful, saying no to the world and all of its temptations and desires. And the only thing that's gotten me through is the grace of God. And I hope in this year of grace that by the end of the year, we understand grace better than we ever had in our lives. And I hope that our lives during 2018 are literally transformed by grace. In the over 30 plus years that I've been a Christian, I've never had a year, let alone people do several sermons on grace. The world's afraid to talk about it because they believe if we really understand the incredible gift that we have, that it'll be a license for sin, that we'll misappropriate and we'll misuse the incredible grace of God and just go out and sin more. In fact, the scriptures teach directly the opposite. The more you understand grace, the more you're touched by grace, the more devoted you are to God. Look in the Holy Scriptures over to Titus chapter 2. Titus chapter 2. Verse 11, for the grace of God has appeared, amen, church, because it didn't have to appear. And where would our lives be if the grace of God had not appeared? It appeared that offers salvation to all people. It teaches us that it's a license for sin. It teaches us to say no to ungodliness and worldly passions and to live self-controlled, upright, godly lives in this present age. Amen, church? While we wait for the blessed hope, the appearing of the glory of our great God and Savior, Jesus Christ, who gave himself for us to redeem us from all wickedness and to purify himself, a people that are his very own, eager to do what is good. I want to know today, is that the PAC Super Region? Yeah. 
Grace has appeared. And let me say from the outset, you can't get anywhere near heaven without grace. Nowhere near. Not in the same neighborhood, not in the same vicinity. You can't get anywhere near heaven without the grace of God. And if you're, if you're here today visiting with us, let me say to you, you can't get anywhere near heaven without God's grace. You need God's favor to change your life and to turn your life around. Many are here today because you've made that decision. Perhaps that's your New Year's resolution. My life's going to turn around in 2018. Well, you need the grace of God. And you need to get in your Bible with the person that invited you here and learn what that grace is all about. I can promise you right now, somebody's going to ask you to study. You can have two responses to that. Yes, I would be happy to study the Bible. Or you can harden your heart and say no and miss the salvation and grace of God. Let's all say yes, amen? amen. You know, you can't get anywhere near. We owe our salvation to grace. It teaches us to say no to ungodliness. When you've been forgiven as much as we've been forgiven, when you've had as much removed as we've had removed in the way of sin, how can we go back to it anymore? Some of us are a little too close to sin for me. Some of us haven't understood that no means no. I'm not going back. I'm not going anywhere near the world. God has done so much for me. Only God can make you say no. Have you figured that out? How many of you were saying no before you got baptized? How many of you are saying no now? Yeah. Only God can make you say no. He says this grace is for right now, today. Some of us, we don't, we don't even have another day. We need to get in touch with this grace right now. There's some of us as disciples, we need to get in touch with this grace right now. And as you study out grace in the scriptures, you always see grace and power together. Grace doesn't make Christians weaker. Grace doesn't make uh, disciples have less convictions. Grace makes you full of power. Where there's grace, there's power. Look in verse 14. He says that it's appeared. And he gave himself for us and redeemed us from wickedness to purify for himself a people that are his own, that are eager to do good. How eager are you this year? We need to be so eager for grace and power like we've never been before in our lives. Amen, church? You know, the Bible is so, so rich in grace because we need help as disciples. We need help as people. Sometimes we don't like to admit just how much help we need. Sometimes we like to rely on our own strength. After walking with God for over 30-something years, there's no pride left. None. I'm tired. Just, just grace. Come on, help me, God. Just bring it on. I'm not trying to do anything on my own anymore. Just help me, Lord. Grace is meant to pick you up, put you on its back, and carry you to heaven. We need help. I appreciated what the sister said about Leanne's lesson and the, the, the crown, uh, the, the, the throne of God and, and royalty. We have the king of kings that we serve. The Bible says we can approach his throne of what? Grace. God sits on a throne of grace and that we can approach him with confidence and find help in our time 
of need, which is all the time. Your time of need spiritually is all the time. Because we're flesh and blood. How many of you are going to go through the day and not sin? How many have sinned already today? And approach his throne with confidence. You know, how many of you husbands, and I want the single men to learn from this, how many of you husbands can admit that there are things that your wife is better at than you? <laughs> Tim's got both hands up. I mean, as men, our, our, our pride doesn't want us to, to be open and face the reality sometimes that we're, we don't have it all together. I know for me, there are things that Emma is better at than me. She knows that. Sometimes I don't always know that as much. But one of the things she's much better than, than, than I am in is that she, her hands are stronger than mine. I'm sorry, it's the truth. I just got to be humble and tell the truth about it. Her hands are stronger than mine. And, and when we're having an argument, you know what she does? She just grabs my hand and starts breaking them. And I straighten, I straighten right up. So if you see us sitting and I'm like, <laughs> got hold of my hand. But I've, I've turned that negative into a positive. And, you know, I used to be a lot more prideful about this than I am now. I just hand it over to her now. But, you know, when, when you have ketchup or pickles and jars with uh, lids on them, when I was younger, I'd, I'd try to turn them and couldn't get them open, and I'd put them through my, through my two knees and squeeze together and try to get them open, and she would just be looking at me like, you poor soul. <laughs> I'd hand the jar to her and... <laughs> See, sometimes we're afraid to admit that we need help. You realize that discipling is God's grace? Your Bible talk leader is God's grace. Your evangelists, your shepherds, your women's ministry leader, your fellow brothers and sisters that'll tell you the truth. Some of us have wandered away from discipling and wandered away from grace and help. You know, I want to challenge us as a super region to take our discipleship to another level in 2018. The more discipling and input we get in our lives, the more awesome our super region is going to be because lives are going to be transformed. How many of us didn't change like we could have because we just stopped listening to advice? We just stopped getting input. We just started thinking we had it all together and wanted to do it our way, wanted to shine on our own. And your shine is turned into darkness. Some of us are struggling with sin. That's appalling. And in the year of grace, we need to let grace make us whole. Are you with me, church? You know, the first time... We see grace in the Bible because the Bible's rich in grace. It's in Genesis chapter 6. The Bible's rich in grace. Genesis chapter 6. Verse 8. The, wicked of the wickedness of the world was so incredibly great. In verse 5, the Lord saw how great the wickedness of the human race had become on earth and that every inclination of the thoughts of the human heart was only evil all the time. The Lord regretted 
that he had made human beings on the earth. And his heart was deeply troubled. So the Lord said, I'm going to wipe them from the face of the earth, the human race I have created. That was Noah included. And with them all animals, the birds and the creatures that move along the ground. For I regret that I have made them. God takes sin seriously. He hates it. He was willing to wipe the earth clean. He said, I regret I even made you. Because you just want to sin. I didn't make you for that. I made you to worship me. I'm so upset with you, I'm taking your animals too. You ain't going to have no birds, no animals or creatures that move along the ground. I'm even taking your little ants. I'm so mad at you. In verse 8, but Noah found grace in the eyes of the Lord. Mothers, have you ever gotten to a point where you regretted that you even gave birth to your child? How disappointed do you have to be to say, I regret you were even born? God takes sin seriously. And we've got to take sin seriously too. But Noah found grace in the eyes of God. Are we going to find grace in 2018, church? Next time we see grace is found over in John chapter 1. The Bible is rich in grace. John chapter 1. I have two points. I probably won't get to them. You have to come back for part two and part three of the sermon. John chapter 1, verse 14. The word became flesh and made its dwelling among us. We have seen his glory and the glory of the one and only son who came from the father. Full of grace and truth. You know, the word became flesh. This Bible became Jesus. And the Bible says that Jesus was full of grace and full of truth. This child then grew up in Luke chapter 2. Luke chapter 2. In Luke chapter 2, verse 40, and the child grew and became strong. He was filled with wisdom and the grace of God was on him. Can you imagine raising a child that had the grace of God on them? I hate to admit it, but as a child, I didn't have the grace on me. I was a very bad child. You ever seen any bad children? (laughs) Jesus was a good child. And the grace of God was on him, even as a child. We know that he preached the word for three years. He died and he went to the cross. And from the cross, that grace was then poured out. 1 Timothy chapter 1 and verse 14. And then look over in Acts chapter 4. Where where was it poured out to? In Acts chapter 4. In verse 32. All the believers were one in heart and mind. And no one claimed that any of their possessions was their own, but they shared everything they had. Does that sound like our church? The believers were together. They didn't claim anything was their own, and they shared 
everything that they had. I'm so proud of this super region for the incredible job you did with missions in 2017. You shared everything you had with disciples around the world. In verse 3, he says, with great power, the apostles continued to testify to the resurrection of the Lord Jesus Christ. And grace was powerfully at work within them all. You see, where there's grace, there's power. And so Jesus poured out that grace. That grace was poured on to all the disciples. And they preached the word powerfully, every one of them. You know, God wants us to be powerful in grace. Amen, brothers and sisters? God's grace was poured out on them all. The first century church was a church of disciples that was full of grace. You know, when you're full of something, that means nothing else can be put in there. And that's why we need to be full of grace. Amen? You know, but then we need to understand that with grace, there are tough times that come in our lives as well. How many of you had tough times last year? It's during those tough times that we need grace as well. Look over in 2 Corinthians. Because grace is meant to help us in our tough times as well. Sometimes we turn to all the wrong things when things get tough. We turn to ice cream and cookies. We turn to our old sinful natures. We turn to independence. We hide out in our caves. We start missing midweeks. Discipling times. Sunday morning. You don't show up at Bible talk anymore. And this is where I really fall in love with Paul. Because Paul understood grace like nobody. He knew where to turn during tough times. In verse 6 of 2 Corinthians 12, he says, Even if I should choose to boast, I would not be a fool because I would be speaking the truth. But I refrain so that no one will think more of me than is warranted by what I say, or because of the surpassing great revelations. Therefore, in order to keep me from becoming conceited. Does anybody need something to keep them from becoming conceited in this room? How many of us struggle with just thinking we're something? I mean, we all need something to keep us from becoming conceited. And you know what? God will provide it. How many of you already know what it is in your life? Should we go around and have everybody tell us what God has put in our lives to keep us from becoming conceited? Paul calls that a thorn. And I don't know about you, but my thorn keeps me faithful. My thorn keeps me humble. Keeps me returning to God. I hate my thorn. How do you feel about yours? These people over here don't have a thorn. These, these people over here. Y'all got thorns over here? Don't sit over there and act like you don't have a thorn. Because God will give you one. Before you get out of your seat. He says that, therefore, in order to keep me from becoming conceited, I was given a thorn in my flesh, a messenger of Satan to torment me. Three times I pleaded with the Lord, take it away from me. But he said to me, my grace is sufficient for you, for my power is made perfect in weakness. 
You need my grace because you need my power. And so God gave the great apostle Paul a thorn because God wanted to make sure Paul had grace. Jesus is on the main line. <laughs> I, I keep my phone up here so I can stay on time. I didn't know the Lord was going to call me, though, right in the middle of the sermon. But Paul was given a, a thorn, and he learned to fall in love with it. There are a lot of you that are visiting with us today. You have a thorn, and you know it, just like all the rest of us have had a thorn. My thorn was so piercing before I became a Christian. I grew up depending and looking up to my dad so much. He, he, was my, he was my everything. He was my hero. I played professional baseball because of him, although I didn't really like the sport. I wanted to be a businessman. I grew up in a, a, a family. My grandfather uh, was one of the largest church leaders in the south side of Chicago. He led St. Bethel Baptist Church. He had six sons. Five of them were ministers. Uh, my dad, John Sr., was the only one that wasn't a minister. He chose to, to have a business career. But my grandfather would plant churches throughout the region, throughout the area. He planted churches in Indiana. He planted churches in Michigan. He planted churches in Missouri. He would preach on Sunday, and then he would drive like to Indiana for an afternoon service, and then he'd drive on over to Ohio for an evening service. And that was his Sunday. My dad wanted sons, but God said no. He blamed my mother for that. And he had five daughters in a row. And he felt cursed by God, and he blamed my mom. And so my mom went and prayed and said, God, if you just give me a son, give me a son to get this man off my back, please, Jesus. Yeah. And she prayed, and, and uh, then I was born, John Adam Causey III. <laughs> And, and growing up, um, you know, I felt like Kentakunte. Because, uh, you know, my mom used to always tell me about that prayer growing up. I'm going to give you back to God one day. And I just could picture her holding me up before the Lord, saying I was going to be given back to God. And so I ran from religion my whole life. I, I was scared to even look at a Bible because I just pictured myself being given back to God. And, and I didn't want that. I wanted to be a regular guy. And then my dad died at 48 years old. In his prime, out of the blue, he, he, he got cancer, and in two months, he was gone. And I'll never forget, I came home from college my freshman year. It was the weekend that he passed away. We spent that weekend together. We talked. And he pulled me in that Sunday right before I was going back to school. And he says, I, I, I want to show you what cancer looks like. I want to show you what my sin looks like. And he disrobed himself and he just showed me the ravage that cancer had put on his body. I'm like, Dad, stop. I mean, close that up. I don't want to see any of that anymore. It, it was one of the most devastating things I'd ever seen in my life. This towering man reduced to nothing. Yeah. My dad at that point was about 80 pounds. And I went back to school and in my heart, I, ne I never thought he was going to die because my dad was bigger than life. I thought, well, you'll put on weight and you'll get to the gym and you'll be okay. And I went back to school and I got a call that night that he was gone. And I realized later my dad wanted me to understand what it meant to not take God seriously. Such a deep hurt, deep pain in my life, I started going to church. 
And I changed on the outside for a little while. And then later that next fall, God allowed a man by the name of Greg Jackson uh, from the international churches to plant a campus ministry at my university. And he prayed for weeks that he would meet somebody that was open. And he prayed that God, the first open door that I see when I get off the elevator, that's the person you have for me. He got on the elevator, went up to the ninth floor. I was a resident assistant there. My door was open because it was the first day of school. And he walked in and shared the gospel with me. And I was baptized six weeks later. But it was that thorn that made me open. For a lot of us here today, God has given you that thorn to make you open. To humble you. To let you know he's still God and that he's still working on you. That, that word thorn in the Greek has the idea of a stake penetrating your flesh. There's some of you that are, you're hurting this morning and God has caused that hurt to get you to study the Bible. And whoever invited you here, God orchestrated the times and the places and the dates and put them right there for you so that you could start your 2018 off the right way. My two points for part two and three next week are chosen by grace and transformed by grace. And we'll continue looking at Paul and just seeing all the incredible things that God has done in Paul's life. But you know, today I want you to understand that this is the year of grace. This is the year that God has made. The Bible is rich in grace, so very, very rich in grace. We can find grace just like Noah found grace at a very difficult time. When perhaps our lives is on the line and the lives of others are on the line, we can find grace. Amen, church? Amen. Jesus, the Son of God, is full of grace and truth. There are a lot of us that we're just looking for the truth today. We just want the truth so that we can find God. I know that's what I wanted. I was so sick of religion. I was so sick of my grandfather's religion. I just wanted the truth. And the Bible was the truth. You know, and as I look at the first century church, I understand that grace was upon them all. You know, our life needs to be a light to the world. When people see us, they need to see the grace of God. Some of us don't want people to see who we really, really are. One of the things I love about Paul is in the scriptures, Paul talks about his conversion six times in his 14 epistles. And even now, how many people do you think Paul is helping become a Christian today because of what he wrote down? Paul is still being fruitful today. Grace needs to be upon us all. And then God's grace is sufficient. You say sufficient for what? Whatever you need. He's given you thorns to get your attention. God whispers when we're doing well. He shouts and blows the trumpet to get our attention through suffering. You know, there's so many incredible things that we can look forward to this year. I was so excited when Monica shared about these incredible fig bookmarks. You know, this, this is Wazira's ministry. And I appreciate uh, Tim, going over and meeting with her and, and allowing this sister who is in difficult situations and, and, and on a sick bed, but still being able to share her faith. And I know there were uh, several of you that weren't able to be there yesterday and get these. We have a stack of these for anybody that didn't get one. Uh, please see one of the ushers and make sure you get one of these. Amen. We also have a bulletin that we put on all of the seats. Thank you, Tim, for writing this. This is amazing. I hope we'll all read this. But inside of the bulletin are the 2018 City of Angels ICC prayer goals. 
And let's go through these. I want to encourage every member of the PAC Super Region to pray about these and to move God to move in all 10 of these areas so that we can see all 10 of these things accomplished in 2018. Amen, church? We also have passed out our pledge and uh, information update. And you'll find your name. Uh, do, do, does everyone have one of these? I think we passed these out already. OK. So let's make sure we fill these out. We want to update our databases and make sure that we can send you information via email if you need it. We also want to be aware of your birthday. Perhaps you can get a birthday cake just like Natalie if we know when your birthday is. <laughs> So uh, make sure you fill that out, your special anniversaries and your special days, because we are family in the kingdom of God. Amen, church? Amen. Also, uh, just on a real sobering note, um, last year when we did our pledges, uh, they were awesome. And if we had hit our pledges, we would have fulfilled all of the financial needs that were necessary for the PAC Super Region and all of our regions. The truth is, though, is we fell short about 16%. There was about a 16% slippage of what brothers and sisters said they would do and what they actually did. Christians do what they say they're going to do. Amen? Our yes is our yes, and our no is our no. Now, this year, uh, because of the budgets, because of the eight mission team plantings that we're sending out in the City of Angels Church and throughout the movement this year, we're going to need every member to up their contribution. Amen. And I'm, I'm going to let you know exactly what we need. Come on, bro. Come on, bro. Now, in the spirit of Acts 4 that I read earlier, disciples came together and met the need. Come on. There were some people that could give more. There were some people that didn't have as much, but gave everything they had. What we need to raise is about $10 a member Come on. to meet our financial obligations. Now, there are some that are students, that are teens, that perhaps are going through life issues, that may not be able to give the full $10. We understand that. Although I believe if God calls us to do something, God will provide a way for us to do it. And so I'm, I'm calling on everyone, whether you have the ability or not, to take this before God and personally try to raise an extra $10 a week in your contribution. But then there are some of us that God has blessed incredibly. I, I know the stock market is up 33% and rising. God has blessed some of us incredibly. Are you going to bless God back? Wow. Come on, bro. There's some of us, you can raise your contribution 50, 100, $200 a week, and it not affect you very much at all. Although I believe every Christian needs to get to a point where it just hurts a little bit. Are you with me right? I didn't hear a lot of amens right there. Now, I say that because none of us can outgive God. Whatever you give, God is going to give it back to you. He may not give it all back to you in money today, but God will give it back a hundred times in this age and in the age to come. We don't want to have to worry about the needs of the church financially. We want to have our focus on seeking and saving the lost. So let's step out on faith. Understand that we need at least $10 from every member, although a lot of us can do a lot more. And I'm personally going to do more. I'm not going to ask you to do something that I'm not willing to do. I don't believe in pointing the way. I believe leaders lead the way. And so... Let's step it up on our missions. And then the other thing, let's not have any slippage 
in 2018. I don't want the administrators going, oh, wow, the PAC super region said they'd give this much. Let's add a 16% loss in that and calculate what they mean by what they say. No, we mean what we say. And let's not have any slippage in 2018. Are you with me, church? Amen. So let's please fill these out and uh, turn these into the ushers. Amen. You know, one of the brothers at the winter workshop challenged us all to be fruitful every month. I don't know about you, but I like a good challenge. Come on. I believe God can do anything that we have as a desire in our hearts. How many of you desire to see somebody become a Christian? Yes. Yeah. Well, one of the things to help us do that is, is something that Tim came up with, which is the push list. Push means let's just pray till something happens. And we're asking every disciple in the PAC super region to come up with a list and put 33 names on your list. You say, well, why 33? Because Jesus gave us 33 physical years on this earth. Let's put on one name for every year Jesus gave us on earth. Here's my list. Soon as he said it, I pulled it out and I just started writing names. Names of people that I really, really want to see become Christians. Amen. God is already working. One of the persons on this list is studying the Bible this week Come to on. become a Christian. Yeah. So I'm going to ask us all to have this list done today. Amen. And what you're going to see, you're going to get to 33 names real quick. And so you might need to start another list. And I've already been adding names to my list because new people are coming into my life every day. I believe that there won't be a person in the PAC super region that won't be fruitful in 2018. And many will be fruitful every month during the year of 2018. What does this mean? All these new disciples, it means we're going to need more Bible talks. I became a Christian October 19th. I was a Bible talk leader on October 20th. Because I was the first person baptized in our campus ministry. I had put together a lot of presentations in business and uh, for my fraternities and other organizations, and I was ready to, to go. Now, my campus minister had to give me the Bible talk, but I led it. And that year, 15 people became disciples. Wow. There are some of you, you are so gifted, you are so talented, but you are also so selfish. There is no reason with what God has given you, you shouldn't be leading a Bible talk. Showing hospitality, having people in your homes. Our lives are hidden in Christ. Let's let the grace of God make us step it up. I would say to you, if you've been a disciple at least a year, you should be a Bible talk leader. How many people have been a disciple at least one year in this audience? Look at all the Bible talks we have. These, these are all the Bible talks we have. This means souls in the kingdom of God. Are you with me, church? Amen, bro. God has given us our thorns to draw us closer to him. Nobody had a thorn or has thorns like oysters. One of my first, the very first gift I gave to Emma was a pearl necklace. I was so proud of myself. <laughs> she was so proud of me. She loved those pearls. But I don't know if Emma realized how much it took to get her those pearl that pearl necklace. It got me her heart, which was worth it. Amen. Amen. But I had to suffer, and so did the oyster. <laughs> the oyster suffered because a grain of sand 
got inside of the oyster, and it was so painful, the oyster had to create a lining around the grain of sand because it couldn't discharge it from itself. And so the lining smoothed the grain of sand out, but it, it wasn't enough, and it kept being painful, and it kept having to put more and more lining on it and more and more lining, and it had to keep smoothing it out until the oyster got big, and, and it's just an ongoing process of smoothing it out and smoothing it out and smoothing it out and pain and pain and smoothing it out and pain and pain and smoothing it out till some fishermen fished it out of the ocean and opened it up, and the pearl was discharged. And that pearl became my wife's necklace. Fifteen of those oysters, by the way. <laughs> but it took a lot of pain for her to have that beautiful oyster. You know, it takes a lot of pain to get to heaven, guys. Jesus told Paul, I will show him how much he must suffer for my name. But Paul learned the secret of Christianity, to be content in any and all circumstances. Paul learned to love his weaknesses. He learned to delight in his thorns. He learned that that thorn was put there to make him closer to Jesus. Some of us don't like the thorns. And God loves the thorn. We want God to take it away. And God keeps saying, no, I'm not going to take it away. Live with it. Because my power is made perfect in weakness. You know, in the year of grace, let's tap into the power of God and be the strong and mighty disciples that God wants us to be. God bless you all.